Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, I want to share something with you today that I think is very basic. It's very simple. I'm not going to keep you a long time, but I do want to get something inside of you, and that is this. The disciples went to Jesus at one point in time, and they said, teach us how to pray. And uh, Jesus said, well, when you pray, pray this way. And that's where we have what is generally called the Lord's Prayer. Uh, he, he said, pray this way, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then it goes on. And so he was giving them an outline of a way to pray. Pray to the Father. But it's interesting that uh, just before he was betrayed by Judas and was arrested and was going to be crucified, he taught his disciples some dynamic spiritual truths. He gave some prophetic words and then in John 16, 32, he concluded all of this teaching by saying this. He said, indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered. He was talking about his disciples there, and, and that's basically what happened. When they came and arrested Jesus, I mean, they, they, they scattered everywhere. Remember, Peter even denied him. They came up to Peter and said, aren't you his friend? And Basically, Peter said, I don't know who you think I am. I may look like somebody that's his friend, but it wasn't me. I mean, the disciples were concerned that they were going to get crucified too, that they were going to get scourged. He said, indeed, the hour is coming, yet has now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet, I'm not alone. Because the Father's with me. And I think that's what we need to understand. Is when it seems like everyone is leaving us. That you're all by yourself. And we've had people in situations where their families left them. Their friends have left them. Sometimes their, their children, their parents, and their spouses left them. And they just feel like they're all by themselves. And there's nothing worse than loneliness. You know, I was talking with a man, this is quite a few years ago, but I was talking with a man who, he, he was married to a woman, and I think he, the name he gave her was the devil. It was something like that. I mean, he said his life was miserable. Every day it was miserable. And he said one day she just left him, ran off, and... Uh, he said, you know, there's one thing and one thing only that's worse than living with a cantankerous person that just drives you nuts. He says, there's one thing worse. And I said, what's that? And he said, loneliness, being by yourself. And I've thought about that over the years, and I'm not sure he's exactly right on that. But I will say this, I've dealt with people uh, just by being a pastor for all these years, I've, I've dealt with people who are by themselves. And loneliness is a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. When you feel that everyone's left you, and that's what they did to Jesus. But Jesus made this statement. He said, you may think I'm alone, but I'm not alone because the Father is with me. And I think that's something we need to remember all the time. We are not alone. You may have your back up against the wall and it may seem like everyone's deserted you and your health is going south and your finances have already gone south, and, but you're not alone. He said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm not going to put you in a place where you have to be lonely. That's what Jesus was saying here. He said, you guys may, he didn't say you may, he said you will. You will scatter. You're going to be scattered. But don't be concerned about me. 
because I am not alone. The Father is here with me. Then in verse 33, he said, these things I have spoken to you. Now he's talking about all of these things that he, he taught. And if you look in your Bible in verses, in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of John, I mean, he just, he teaches them some very deep things. He said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Now that's true. You go out into the world, you're going, that word tribulation can also be translated tests and trials. In the world there's problems. But he said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. He's not going to overcome the world. He has already overcome the world. And then, after he said all of these things, so that we could have peace, what's one of the things he said? Uh, back in John chapter 14, uh, he started out, and you've all heard this, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. And then he went on to say, I'm going to go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Then he comes back and he, with this, he says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and get you so that you can be with me. And he teaches them all of these things in chapters 14, 15, and 16. And then he's done teaching, and then he prays. Now, I understand that when people talk about the Lord's Prayer, they, they think in terms of when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and he said, when you pray, pray this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, etc. But starting the very next verse in John chapter 17, verse 1, is the prayer that Jesus prayed himself to the Father just before he got arrested and crucified. And I think it's so interesting to hear what he had to say to the Father. And that's all we're going to do today. We're just going to basically go through his prayer and see what he had to say. John chapter 17, verse 1. Then Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said. Now, just let me tell you something right there. It's okay to close your eyes and bow your head when you pray. It's okay. It shows reverence. That's fine. But you'll find most of the time in the Bible, when they were praying, they lifted up their head, they lifted up their hands, and they looked to heaven. They, they looked to where the prayer was going. Now, sometimes you've got to shut your eyes and get everything kind of cleared out. Don't do that when you're driving down the road. you know. But he says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. Now here's one thing you're going to find in the Scripture, and Jesus talks about this here, is the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. Anytime you read about the Holy Spirit, it's glorifying, amplifying, and pointing to Jesus. It's the Spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God. But the Spirit points to Jesus. Jesus always points to the Father. He never takes credit. The Holy Spirit doesn't take credit. The Holy Spirit gives Jesus the credit. Jesus doesn't take credit. He gives the Father the credit. You know, there's times when Jesus said, it's not me that does the works, it's the Father in me that does the works. Okay, verse 2, as you have given him, referring to himself, authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life, you see that? Talking about Jesus here, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now, God has given the world to Jesus, all the people of the world. However, the only people who receive from Jesus are the ones who receive Jesus. Now, you got to get the concept 
when the Bible talks about many are called but few are chosen, God loved the world. I said God loved the world. Now, now don't take this wrong. I didn't say Jesus loved the world. I said God loved the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he, who? God, gave, who? Jesus. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus so that whoever would believe in Jesus would not perish but have everlasting life. However, sometimes, and you've got to take this in balance and don't twist what I'm saying here. Sometimes we focus so much on Jesus that we forget that it's God who loved us so much that he sent Jesus. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. Yes, Jesus gave his life. Yes, Jesus was obedient to the Father. But it's the Father who loved us. And when Jesus prayed, when he gave the example of the Lord's Prayer, and he said, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, we pray to the Father. I said, we pray to the Father. Who's Jesus praying to here? To himself? No, he's praying to the Father. Now, now once again, and, and I say this as, as a caution, because you can take some of these little things that I'm saying and, and get them out of context and, and go crazy with them. But basically this, we don't pray to the Holy Spirit. And we don't pray to Jesus. We pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. Jesus has given us power of attorney to use his name so that we can go to the Father and say, Dear Father, in the name of Jesus. In other words, I'm coming to you to talk to you and I'm authorized to talk to you because I believe in Jesus. And because I believe in Jesus, he has given me his name, power of attorney to use his name so I can talk to you just as he talked to you. Are you following me there? Now, I understand if your car's going over the cliff and you scream out, help me, Jesus, don't go, well, I don't know if he heard me or not because I didn't pray to the Father. No. <laughs> like I say, don't get this out of balance. God knows your heart. He knows the intentions of your heart. But I'm just saying, generally speaking, let's don't forget who loved us so much that he sent his son. All right. Now, his son is praying to him, and this is after Jesus has done everything that he's supposed to do. He's getting ready to be put on the cross and say, it's finished. Okay? That's just hours away. That he's going to say, it's finished. Well, he's already, basically, he's already finished everything. He's just waiting for the execution, the crucifixion to be carried out. Now, verse 3. Jesus is still talking to the Father. This is in John chapter 17. And this is eternal life that they, now he's got his disciples all around him, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Remember John 3, 16? God sent Jesus. And he's, he's acknowledging that. Now in verse 4. He says, I have glorified you on the earth. In other words, did Jesus go around lifting up his own name? No, he knew his name had authority. He gave his name so that the authority could be used. But when the opportunity came and people started talking about how great he was, he basically pointed to the Father. And he said, it's the Father that does the works. You know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember? Then he says in verse 5. Well, let's finish verse 4. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself. See, he, didn't, he, he doesn't want to be glorified just him. He didn't say, lift me up. Make my name great. No. 
glorify me together with yourself with the glory that I had with you. Now follow me on this. The glory that I had, which I had with you before the world was. Now, this tells us that Jesus was with the Father. He was being glorified with the Father before the creation of the world. When uh, the Scripture talks near the end of the New Testament, and we have a, a series on this, talks about the world that was, Jesus is saying before the world that was, the Father and I were glorified together. Boy, that's powerful. Verse 6, I have manifested your name. Whose name did he manifest? The Father's name. I have manifested your name to the men you have given to me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have been kept and they have kept your word. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus and he gave the world the people to Jesus. And out of those people that received Jesus, he says, you have given me out of the world, they were yours, God loved the world, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. And so now we need to ask ourselves this sometimes, are we keeping his word? Do we live our life wanting to be biblically correct, or do we want to be politically correct? Verse 7, now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. Here he's restating again, these that you have given me that are following me, I have, they know, they know that all the things which you have given me, everything that I have is from you. We need to acknowledge that from time to time. What I have, I may have a lot. You may have a lot. But where did it come from? We're blessed. And it's the blessing of the Father. Mm. Verse 8. For I have given them the words which you have given me. That's what we're supposed to do. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit will give us the words to speak. And it's not just so we will know what he says, it's so that we will say what he says when we're out in the world. Now, we're not of the world, and he'll tell us that in a minute. We're not of the world, but we're in the world. And when we're in the world, we're supposed to say what he says. I love the song our worship team sings. Say what God says. And the scripture says, in another place, that there's going to be times when you don't know what to say, but don't get stressed out about it because the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say when the time comes to say it. You may not know what you need to say when you get confronted, but when you're supposed to speak, the Holy Spirit will tell you what to speak. And I'll tell you, when you get into a situation and your back's against the wall and you want to talk but the Holy Spirit hasn't told you anything, keep your mouth shut. It's better to say nothing than to say something that the Holy Spirit didn't tell you. Hmm. Verse 8 again. For I have given them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have, and they have believed that you sent me. See, that's a very important thing. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, in order to be saved, in order to have our assurance in heaven, we've got to believe, one of the things we've got to believe is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, I've heard people preach, I've heard, 
And, and I understand, you know, you've got to take all these things in context, but I've heard people say, and Jesus rose from the dead, and he decided to get up. No, 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 wait. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says three different places it talks about how Jesus was raised from the dead. One place it says he was raised from the dead by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Well, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. My, Holy, my Spirit is, is me. Matt's spirit is Matt. Matt's spirit is Matt. God's spirit is God. So Jesus was raised from the dead by the spirit of God. He was raised from the dead by God. Another place says Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of God. Well, the glory of God is just the manifested presence of God. So Jesus was raised from the dead by the presence of God. And then another place it says that God raised him from the dead. So did Jesus come back to life? Now, I say this respectfully and don't take it out of context again. But did Jesus come back to life on his own? No, he died. And in his spirit body, while his physical body was laying in the tomb, in his spirit body, he went down. He went to paradise. Remember, he told the thief on the cross, today you and I are going to be together in paradise. So he did things in his spirit body for those three days, but his physical body laid dead in the grave in the tomb. And then the father on the third day said, Get up. Wow, powerful. Mm. But who did that? The Father. Now, do not ever think that when I amplify the Father that I'm taking something away from Jesus. I'm not. Because remember this, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father and I are one. Hmm. Verse 9. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, what does that mean? That means that when you do the work of the Father and believe in Him, then you actually are glorifying Him. In the same way that when Jesus did the work of the Father, as He said earlier, He was glorifying the Father. You amplify the one that you are submitted to. Verse 11, Now, I am no longer in the world. Because see, he knew just a few hours he was, he was fulfilling his calling. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. He's talking about his disciples out here. They're in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are one. Now he's saying he wants us, all of us who follow him, to be one with him in the same way that he's one with the Father. Hmm. Verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, we know who that is, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Look at verse 13. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, when you're in the world... If you will say what he says and believe what he says about you, 
then no matter what the circumstances are, you can have joy. Kind of gets back to what James said in his letter. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials. You can be going through a trial, and you may not be happy that you're going through it, but you can have a joy on the inside of you that you know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and no weapon formed against you is going to prosper, and you will be on the other side of this trial before long. See, and that's good news. So Jesus is reassuring them. See, he knows that they're all listening. How did John know to write this down? Because John was there and heard him pray. He's saying this in front of his disciples. Hmm. Verse 14, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, he said they're in the world, but now here he's saying they're not of the world. Now, why do we need to be in the world if we're not of the world? Well, Chris Stevens is a perfect example of that the pastor of the Biker Church down here in Camdenton, one of my associate ministers here at Walk on the Water Faith Church, great man of God. But he has told me so many times that if you're not in the world and letting them know you're not of it, in other words, you're in the world, but you're not living like the world. You're in the world, but you're, you're showing Jesus. How can you witness to the lost if you never talk to the lost? See? So we can't just hold up in this auditorium and, you know, if we've got a family, say, my four, no more. You know, I'm staying here with Jesus. No, th that's good. We need to assemble and fellowship and gather together. But how can the world know Jesus if we're not in the world? But the key is, to be in the world without allowing the world to get in us. Hmm. And you know what? Sometimes the world will hate you if you don't play their games. You can, you can go to their meetings. You can do their, their thing. But you don't have to be like them. Now, one of the uh, deacons in our church is Larry Gowdy. You all know Larry Gowdy. And Larry Gowdy uh, has a marina. And uh, my family still owns one. But uh, back in the day, before I was ever pastor of the church, I was president of the uh, Lake of the Ozarks Marine Dealers Association. And uh, Larry Gowdy was the president before me, and when I became president, he became vice president. And every year, the marine dealers would have a major Christmas party down at Tantara. Well, I may have been president, but I wasn't the entire board, so I wasn't in charge of the Christmas party. And sometimes the Christmas parties would, in my opinion, get a little out of hand. I don't know if you've ever been around a bunch of uh, drunk marine dealers before, but uh, at any rate, I was president, so I showed up. Larry Gowdy was vice president, he and his wife, good Christian people, and everybody else was going around with drinks, and well, we just had, you know, carbonated water. We had club sodas or water, whatever, and uh, we were there, and we didn't participate in anything that was not Christian, but uh, What's interesting is, well, I will tell you this too. They did put a picture of me on the front page of the local newspaper. I was drinking my water out of a wine glass because that's all they had. And they had a picture of me and Larry Gowdy standing there with our wine glasses that looked like we, well, whatever. At any rate, the Bible says abstain from all appearances of evil, but sometimes it just happens. But it's amazing how many marine dealers got saved because they would come to either me or Larry and they would say, look, 
hey, you, you guys aren't drinking. What's, what's going on? Are, are you Amish or something? What, what's going on here? Uh, you know, you got a liver problem? You can't... No, we say, no, we just, uh, we just don't drink because we, uh, we want to be in control of ourselves and we're Christians and we just don't think it's a good Christian witness if we drink and get drunk with you guys. And, uh, you know, I remember one marine dealer, he had a big marina down here, he, he said to me, he said, uh, <laughs> you're nuts. Just like that. Well, of course, he was half tanked when he said that. And uh, so before they got into all the games, usually Larry Gowdy and our wives, we would, we would slip out and we'd, we'd go home, you know. But uh, after we started this church, one of the marine dealers uh, collected Bibles and old books, and he sold them on the Internet. Uh, it was just a hobby he had. He would go to garage sales and he would buy old books and uh, find an old book in there and put it up on eBay or something and sell it. And he, he made quite a bit of money. And one day he went to a garage sale and he bought a sack of books and he was taking the books out. And when he went to take the bottom book out, which looked like a real old embossed book, Electricity came into his hands, he said, and he, he, he felt shocked, and he, he backed off. And uh, so he finally got the book out, and it was a Bible. It was about 150 years old. Big, thick thing. He didn't know what to do. So he called my mother to find out where I was because he knew that I was a Christian and I could explain to him why he got shocked when he grabbed this Bible. So he came over to the church and he's got the Bible in a sack and he's kind of afraid to get it out. And so we go up to my office and bottom line is I've still got the Bible in my office. He gave it to me, but that Marine dealer got saved. He got born again, and it, I attributed it all the way back to 35 years ago when we kind of drew a little bit of a line. We were in the world, but we were not of the world. And it doesn't mean that you can't stand around the water cooler while one of your co-workers is drinking a beer and you're drinking a cup of coffee or something. It doesn't mean that you condemn them you ridicule them or or whatever sometimes just just being who you are look just being whose you are is all that's necessary and you may say well I didn't make any difference I, you know well people are watching you you don't realize how many people in the world are watching you and if they think it's okay for you well it's okay for them you've got to set some kind of a standard. If you don't, then they're going to think there is no standard. You know, um, now I, I have no problem, and I, I hesitate to even say this because somebody will think I do have a problem with it, but the church should look like the church. And when somebody is lost and they're hurting and they walk into the church and it's kind of like a nightclub and there's strobe lights and smoke machines and coffee shop. There's nothing wrong with coffee. I had a coffee just before the service, okay? I like my non-fat oat milk latte with two shots, okay? There's nothing wrong with coffee, coffee shop. There's nothing wrong with mood lighting and a smoke machine. There's nothing really sinful about that. But let me tell you something, and, and I know this from experience and from counseling with a lot of people. When, they, when somebody is hurting and their spouse has left them, their kid has done something stupid, maybe they've done something stupid, they're hurting, and they come to church, 
They're not wanting to walk into a nightclub. They're wanting to walk into the house of God. They don't want what they had. They want something different. They want to come in where there's lights. They want to come in where truth is being spoken. They want help. And they found out that the drunk sitting at the bar down at the nightclub had, that's been through eight marriages and, and beats his wife or whatever, he doesn't have good advice. And they're coming in here, they're looking for you. Now, they're not looking for you to be like Ned Flanders or anything. That's Homer Simpson's next door neighbor. They're not looking for you to be spiritually weird. Are you following me? They don't want you, they, they're not coming in here looking for somebody who's acting like a Christian. They want to find somebody that's real, who is a Christian, who, like Jesus says, they're living in the world, but not of the world. We all have to, even I, as a pastor, I'm in the world all the time. And so are you. But just because we're in the world, we should never blend in so much that people think we're of the world. They should be able to tell a difference. Once again, I don't mean to embarrass him, but Chris over here, he, he wears these colors. Stand up, Chris. Show people, show people your colors. Christian Motorcycle Association. When does he wear that? He sleeps in it. <laughs> and he has, <laughs> his pajamas have got that logo on them. No. <laughs> but he's given me stories about how he'll be at the gas station. And it says Christian Motorcycles Association. And somebody will ask him a question. Now, I'll tell you what. I've had people come up to me, and, and they're just drunker than a skunk. Uh, huh? Huh? Don't wear it if you can't share it. Well, that's right. Don't act like a Christian and somebody says, well, how do I get saved? You go, go talk to my pastor. No, you need to be able to not be weird about it. See, Christians shouldn't be weird. We're the most real people in the world. All right. So Jesus said, in verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. See, even Jesus said, don't take them out of the world. Leave them there, because when they're there, they can witness and share my glory that you gave me. Verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And you need to remember that. Everywhere you go, it doesn't... It doesn't matter if you're in the checkout line at the, at the uh, gas station getting ready to, you know, pay for your coffee and your Milky Way bar. Be godly wherever you are. Because if people find out you're a Christian, then they're going to think you're acting like God. And if you act mean and jerky, they're going to think, well, that's the way God is. They are not of this world, not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. You want sanctified be, talks about, it means be made holy, become holy. You want to become holy? Here's the manual on how to do it, okay? Then he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. All right, so he was saying, I'm not just praying for these disciples. I'm praying for everybody that's going to believe in me through the word that's spoken through these people right here. And what are we doing? We're reading the word spoken by one of them there. This is from John. He was there. Verse 21. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, 
that they also may be made one in us that the world may believe that you sent me. Remember it said, Jesus said, uh, I was with you before the world that was. Well, a lot of people get curious about in Genesis where God speaks in the plural. Now, the very first phrase of the Bible, and you all know this, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the Hebrew, it's Barashit bara Elohim et ha shemaim ha-aretz. God created the heavens and the earth. The word Elohim there that's translated God is plural. It's plural. We say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but the word translated God is technically plural. But as the story goes, King James said, no, we believe in one God. So you cannot, you cannot say gods. We believe in one God. So they changed it, basically, put it this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But they didn't catch it everywhere. Because, for example, the phrase where God, and God said, let us create man in our image. That's plural. Let us create man in our image. So who's the us and who's the our? It's kind of like at the Tower of Babel. And God said, let us go down and confuse their language. Who's he talking about? Well, Jesus was there. And even here, Jesus is talking about him and the Father. And he's saying us. Okay. That was just a little rabbit trail, but it was kind of fun, wasn't it? All right. He said, I and them and you and me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Remember, for God so loved the world. And there he says he loves us as much as he loves Jesus. You think, well, that's impossible. No, that's it's true. Even in the New Testament, it says when we receive Jesus, eventually at some point in time, we are joint heirs with him. That seems impossible. And what's a joint heir? That means everything he gets, we get. Everything we get, he gets. Wow, that's powerful. All right. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. See, he won't even say his glory without saying where it came from. Which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. There's another acknowledgement that Jesus was there. Verse 25, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. Verse 26, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. We are, once we become born again believers, throughout eternity we are going to be known as the body of Christ, the bride, a part of him. Wow, that's powerful. Now, just a couple more passages here. John 18, 1, this is right after this. When Jesus had spoken these words, in other words, as soon as he prayed, he went out with his disciples over the book, Brook Kidron. That's right between, uh, like if you're on the Mount of Olives and, and you go over to the Temple Mount, you go through the Kidron Valley there, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And we've, we've had communion uh, there many times. Verse 2, And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew that place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. And so what happened? As soon as Jesus gets done praying, the enemy shows up to arrest him. Now, Jesus, the fulfillment of his mission was to sacrifice his body. That was part of his mission. 
but he has already done that. Your mission is not to sacrifice your body. He did it. He was the once and for all sacrifice. But I'll tell you what, the same thing happens. I've seen it happen so many times. You make your petition known to God. You call out to God in the name of Jesus. And when you say amen and you back up, it seems like the enemy is waiting. He knows where you are and he's coming to get you. That's where you stand strong. That's where you take last Sunday's sermon. And after you've done everything you're supposed to do, you've said everything you're supposed to say, stand. Don't flinch. Don't retreat. Stand strong. Because Jesus has already paid the price. You don't have to pay it. And you need to know that. And if you think that there's some suffering that you've got to go through in order for your deliverance to be complete, then what you're saying is, is that the suffering that Jesus went through was not enough. You've got to add your little bit of suffering to his little bit of suffering. No, you don't have to add anything. It's done. It's over. All right, the last passage here. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now look at this which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If the devil would have known how it was all going to turn out, the devil wouldn't have crucified him. And here's what you need to understand. Jesus, who is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, knows everything that is going to happen in your life. You are not predestined, but God foreknows everything because he can see down through the passage of time and he knows what's going to come. The devil is not omnipresent. The devil does not know what's going to come. So here's the deal. The scripture says the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. You can have a heads up on what's going on. The devil didn't have a heads up. He didn't know that God was going to raise Jesus from the dead. He didn't know that. If he would have known that, he wouldn't have crucified him to begin with. So here's the thing. You may be going through a trial. You may be having a trouble in your life. But God has a plan of deliverance for you. The devil doesn't know what that plan of deliverance is. But he will lie to you and tell you you cannot be delivered. He will lie to you and tell you that all is lost, but you've got to not listen to him. You've got to listen to God and believe that no weapon formed against you will prosper, and that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I've made my petition, and he said, if I, if I speak his will, I get his will. And so now I'm not going to move. I'm standing here. Devil, go fly a kite. I'm, I'm done. Father, in the name of Jesus, we call forth your presence in manifestation in every way, in healings, restoration. I rebuke, Father, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. I rebuke the spirit of discouragement. I sense by the Holy Spirit that there, is, there was brought into this room discouragement and despair. But I'm proclaiming to you right now that you don't have to leave this room. We, we can get rid of that right now. If, if you're... Come on. If, if you've got any discouragement in your life, any despair of any kind... Don't let pride stand in the way. Just stand up right now. We're going to rebuke that right now. We're going to rebuke that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We're going to rebuke that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You've been praying for something and you haven't seen it and you're, you feel beat down. Stand up right now. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, you gave us authority over all principality and powers, over the 
darkness, over demonic spirits. Father, we, we know according to your word that discouragement and despair is not of you. We know according to your word that we can speak and that the enemy has to flee. We submit to you. We resist the devil and he will flee. So Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I speak to demons of discouragement, despair, of distraught. And I command you in the name of Jesus to leave the house of God that you are attacking right now. And I say, you're free. You're free. Say it. I'm free. I'm free. I am free. Say it. I am free. Believe it. I'm free. I'm free. Woohoo! 